Okay, um, hello everyone. So now in this next uh, set of videos, we're finally going to move beyond the scalar fields that we've been discussing all this time in this QFT2 course. And we're going to discuss fermions from the point of view of the path integral. So at first, I just want to review a few things that you've learned earlier about fermions in IFT. This is just to make sure that we're all on the same page. I'm just going to review a few things about fermions in canonical quantization. So this is section 6.1 in my notes. Fermions in canonical quantization. And after I review that, we're going to discuss how to get the same physics from the path integral. As we're going to see, this is going to require us to introduce an entirely new kind of number. Uh, but we'll get there in the next video. So first, fermions in canonical quantization. So um, I'm going to only talk about Dirac fermions. So let me remind you what a Dirac fermion is. A Dirac fermion is some given by some field, psi of x. Um, and psi of x is quantized in such a way so that its canonical commutation relation results in a fermion. To be more precise, we can write down the so-called Dirac Lagrangian. The Dirac Lagrangian takes the form s of psi and psi bar equals to the integral d4x psi bar i d slash minus m psi. And uh, the variation of this action with respect to psi gives you the Dirac equation, which is, of course, i d slash minus m psi equals to 0. And just to remind you, this slash is just notation. The slash is defined to be gamma mu d mu. And you have studied the properties of the gamma matrices in, uh, in IFT. And so when we have this Lagrangian, we then promoted the field psi to an operator that acts on the Hilbert space of the quantum field theory. Okay, So psi of x became an operator. Now, um, let me remind you, there are two things that are different about the Dirac field relative to the scalar field that we've been studying all of this time. So the first thing is that psi is actually a four component object called a spinner. It's not just a single component like the scalar field, it's a four component object. So I could give it an index, for example, alpha that runs over these four components. And what that means is under a Lorentz transformation, So under a Lorentz transform, lambda, which uh, belongs to SO3 comma 1, there's an expression that looks like this. Okay, and uh, I should probably raise the index here. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, this is correct, and I should lower the index here. Okay, so uh, so what's going on here? So this what this is telling you is that here I have a matrix U of lambda, not a matrix, sorry, an operator U of lambda. This operator acts on the quantum field theory Hilbert space, and it represents the Lorentz transformation on that Hilbert space. So it represents gamma on the Hilbert space of the quantum field theory. On the other hand, this M here is just a normal matrix. And this matrix acts on spinner indices, A and B. And this acts on spinner indices in the way as to give you a spin half representation of the Lorentz group. And so not only is psi a, a four-component object, those four components transform into each other as a spin-half representation of the Lorentz group. And um, you have studied all of this, I think, in, in IFT and in group theory. And um, if not, you can review in Peskin uh, how all of this stuff works. So the upshot of all of this is that the Dirac field is not a scalar field. The Dirac field has spin-half.
And I realize, I'm sorry, I should not have called this index alpha, I should call it A, I'm using notation where A runs over spinner indices. Okay, so that's one thing that is very different about the Dirac field and the scalar field. The scalar field has been zero, the Dirac field has been half. Um, there's another thing which is different. The other different thing is that the Dirac field obeys anti-commutation relations, not commutation relations. So what that means is that the analog of the canonical commutator for the scalar field is instead the following canonical commutator for the Dirac field. Psi A of X, Psi B dagger of X, another Y, Delta three, X minus Y, Delta A B, and Psi A of X, Psi B of Y equals two, Psi A dagger of X, Psi B dagger of Y, equals to zero, okay? And of course, in general, uh, A curly bracket B is AB plus B it. So this plus sign in the anti-commutator means that these relations are very different from the scalar, uh, the scalar which we discussed earlier, okay? So in particular, this means, this fact implies that fermions obey Fermi-Dirac statistics, hence the name. Okay. So in, uh, in usual quantum mechanics, what Fermi-Dirac statistics means is that the wave function of your system is anti-symmetric in uh, the coordinates of two fermion uh, variables, uh, sorry, as a function of the two fermion coordinates. In QFT, we encode that information in a slightly different manner. So in particular, if we write the Dirac field in terms of creation annihilation operators, in other words, if I write a formula like this, you've seen these things many times, This is just the usual decomposition of the fermion field into creation annihilation operators. There's a few extra bells and whistles here, which I'll explain in a second. Okay. We're here, the A's and the B's create and create annihilate, create annihilate particles and antiparticles respectively. And the U's are sort of uh, spinner polarization vectors then you can show that the A's and B's obey relations that look like this. A, R, P, A, S, Q equals two B, R, P, B, S, Q. So again, just to remind you, here the S's run over the two different spin states that are possible, okay? And uh, these P's run over momentum, like usual. And finally, there are some kinematic factors here. There are different ways to normalize the creation and relation operators. Um, so you may or may not see this factor of EP in on the right-hand side, depending on exactly which reference you're looking at. Uh, we're not gonna use this commutator too much, so I'm not, I'm not gonna dwell on the details here. But let me stress that all other anti-commutators are zero. In particular, if I just look, for example, at two creation operators for the fermion, this anti-commutator, let me do them with the same momentum and the same spin. So in other words, I set these two things equal. This anti-commutator, of course, is just two times the square of the operator itself 
because I have the same operator here and here. Uh, this is equal to zero. Okay. And what that means is you can never act on a state with the same creation operator twice. If you do that, you just get zero again. So this implies that you can never put two fermions with the same momentum and the same spin the momentum of course is given by p and the spin is given by r in the same state okay and this is this is what you normally think of as the pauli exclusion principle this is uh, just really important in in real life so basically this is the reason why for example in, you have all these fancy atoms all these fancy electrons this is the only reason why all of the electrons don't sink down into the lowest orbital, okay? So um, that would probably make chemistry much easier, but I think it would be bad for the existence of complex structures and life and stuff like that. So uh, this is Pauli exclusion, and it is important. Okay. Okay. So um, it turns out that these two facts that might seem unrelated a priori, in other words, the two facts being that the Dirac field psi transforms like a spinner, a spin half spinner under Lorentz transformations, and that the quantum operator that you get from it obeys anti-commutation relations. The spin and the statistics are actually related. Okay, so these two facts about the spin halfness of it and the anti-commuting statistics of it. are related by what's called the spin statistics theorem. So this is a fancy theorem in quantum field theory, but what that basically says is that if you have a sort of nice theory in that it is unitary and Lorentz invariant and so on, and you have something that transforms like a spin half field, then you have to quantize it so it has anti-commutating uh, statistics. So you get anti-commutating operators from it. And um, this theorem can be proven. It's maybe also instructive to just try to quantize it the wrong way. In other words, try to quantize a spin half field with commuting statistics so you can see what happens. Uh, that doesn't work out. Okay. okay. So um, one final thing that I'm going to discuss from the canonical formalism is the form of the Hamiltonian. Okay. So what is the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian for the Dirac fields, this is the Dirac Hamiltonian, it looks like this, which is an integral of d3p over 2 cubed dp. Uh, sorry, there's also a 2 here. And then that's just kinematical. And then you integrate a raw momentum, you have a factor of the energy of the state, and then you count the number of particles in that state. So you do that both for the particle state and for the antiparticle state, excuse me, put an extra dagger there. And then there's a zero point energy. Okay. What is zero point energy? If you go through it carefully for the Dirac field, you find that there's a minus sign here in the zero point energy. Okay. So the zero point energy for fermions contributes with a minus sign. The two is because there are particle states and antiparticle states. Now, um, that minus sign would have been a plus sign for scalar fields, okay, for commuting fields. So this minus sign turns out to be important, so I'm just gonna emphasize the zero point energy for fermions has the opposite sign. Okay, and that concludes the brief review of fermions in the canonical formalism. Next, we're going to try to understand how to get all of this from the path integral formalism.